most of us want to leave something for those we leave behind. It's a beautiful sacrifice that people make. This is our opportunity to give back to the men and women who do so much for us. Trust at Navy Mutual is, is essential. Trust is everything. Trust is the centerpiece of what we do here at Navy Mutual. We've been doing it for 130 plus years. Welcome to the Navy Memorial SITREP Speaker Series, and thank you for joining us today. Because of COVID, the Navy Memorial has rapidly moved our efforts online. Now we're producing these SITREPs, wreath lane ceremonies, promotion ceremonies, re-enlistment ceremonies, all of them online. As a matter of fact, our Lone Sailor Award program is still available on our website if you haven't had a chance to see it. We're doing that because our mission is just too important to let COVID stop us. Our mission is that to honor recognize and celebrate the men and women of the sea services, past, present, and future, and to inform the public about their service. We're honored today to have the Secretary of the Navy, Ken Braithwaite, join us. As you can see on the platform, you'll be able to ask questions. We encourage you to ask questions. We also encourage you to like the questions that you want to see asked, and those questions that are liked the most will float to the top. We also have a couple questions from the fleet today. Before I get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, Navy Mutual Aid Life Insurance Company is our series co-sponsor for the year. And our sponsors are Huntington Ingalls, uh, uh, excuse me, Finn Cantieri, uh, and Dell. And our co-sponsors are Murata, BAE Systems, and LMI. We literally could not do what we do without their support. So let's get started. It's my honor to introduce the Secretary of the Navy, the 77th Secretary of the Navy, Kenneth J. Braithwaite. Uh, Secretary Braithwaite's a P3 pilot, a businessman, a Navy public affairs officer, rising to the rank of Rear Admiral and serving as the Vice Chief of Information. And after service uh, uh, in the Navy, he continued as a businessman and most recently was a U.S. Ambassador to Norway. Secretary Braithwaite, thank you for joining us and we'd love to hear some opening remarks. <laughs> Admiral, thank you very much for having me. And first and foremost, to be here at the Navy Memorial, the vision of the uh, godfather of our community, Admiral Thompson. Um, we owe him a, date, a great debt of gratitude as the United States Navy for the work that he did here to create this memorial, but also to you, my dear friend and shipmate, for the work that you've done to continue that legacy on and move it into the future. So um, thank you on behalf of uh, all who serve in the United States Navy today. Um, we appreciate your work, Admiral. Um, you might know that uh, Teddy Roosevelt is a big hero of mine. And uh, President Roosevelt uh, had been the Assistant Secretary of the Navy uh, in uh, the uh, McKinley administration um, before he became Vice President. Uh, but he had a great quote, and I'd like to start with that. And that is, a great Navy is not a provocation to war. It is the surest guarantor of peace. And so, as we look to the future around great power competition, we need to remember that it is the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps that are going to be that first line of defense, if you will, that first deterrent. We have moved into a new uh, era of great power competition, revisiting our youth as young naval officers up against challenges around the globe that are unprecedented, truly unprecedented. And what I mean by that is never has concept of democracy, of freedom, the things that we hold near and dear that you and I grew up with have ever been under the kind of pressure and future threats and challenges since the War of 1812. And why do I say that? 1812, the United States went to war with Great Britain, right? Um, our ancestral founder uh, as a former colony, it was an experiment between 1781 and 1812. We went back to war with Great Britain during that time, and we fought, especially the Navy fought extremely well in 1812. By 1813, 
Great Britain put a lot more pressure and emphasis on fighting us. And it was only because Great Britain was involved in conflict on uh, the continent in Europe that they were unable to put their full force towards us. So that allowed us to sue for peace, which we did, and guaranteed that we would have the nation that we have now um, assumed, the greatest nation the world has ever known. That concept of democracy is under immense pressure today. I've seen it with my own eyes. You mentioned as the US ambassador to Norway, the Chinese are all over this globe, supplanting our efforts to ensure that freedom of navigation, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, all the things that democracies hold near and dear to who they are, that is what is at threat today. And the only line of defense, the principal, I should say, line of defense that stands between them and us is the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps. Um, NDS, the National Defense Strategy and the Distributive Maritime Operations Plan uh, that Admiral Greener and Admiral Richardson came up with, gave us the guide stars that have given us the direction of where we need to move into the future. Um, coming into this role, I knew that uh, the stakes would be high, predicated again on what I've seen um, you know, recently in my travels. Um, but understanding the importance of the Navy, I started on a path to ensure that uh, we could afford the fleet of the future, first and foremost. And I picked up on the work of my predecessor, Secretary Spencer, on really looking at the Navy's budget. And I know we're going to talk about that a little later, but there wasn't one stone that was not turned over to look to accrue the savings that we could to pay for that Navy of the future. And then most recently, my boss, Secretary of Defense, uh, Dr. Mark Esper, announced our new naval, uh, our, our new naval force, uh, future naval force uh, structure study, uh, predicated on the fact that we need to build um, a greater fleet. So was 355 the number? Do we need to look to a larger manned, unmanned fleet? And as you saw those numbers, it's a mix between both. Focused a lot on our capabilities at sea of sea control, power projection, uh, re-emphasizing the importance of uh, the carrier strike group, the CVN, looking to new elements of a fleet, the CVL, the light carrier, which I'm a big advocate, uh, and my mentor, John Lehman, and I have talked many hours about uh, the possibilities of bringing the CVL back online. Huge emphasis on submarines and building our uh, force up to 70 to 80 submarines, including um, a new class of SSBNs, the Columbia, which is under construction today. I've been up to uh, electric boat. I've seen the early work. And I'd like to announce today, here, right now, that the second boat will be named USS Wisconsin, um, following in the wake of the great battleship, which is a museum ship now mm -hmm. in Norfolk. It's about time we had another USS Wisconsin. So the second boat will be the Wisconsin. The second a Columbia class the second SSBN. That is correct, Admiral. That's great. Yeah, so she'll be the USS Wisconsin. Um, and then, of course, uh, a recent announcement on the naming of the new Constellation class frigate uh, built by one of your sponsors, Tim Cantari. Um, you know, we're looking to build 60 to 70 small surface combatants. And these frigates are a lot different than the Knox class or Oliver, Had mm -hmm. Oliver Hazard Perry class frigates that you and I remember, you know, in our youth. Mm -hmm. um, these are highly capable, sophisticated uh, weapons platforms uh, projecting sea power um, around the globe. Um, so then, we coupled that, uh, and we're about to announce a new tri-service maritime strategy that will be um, a vision between uh, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard. Uh, that will be coming out in the next few weeks as we've narrowed in specifically how that study marries up to the national uh, defense strategy. Um, my recent uh, tour of duty in the Arctic um, with uh, my experiences in Norway led me to believe we need a U.S. Navy Arctic strategy, which I believe is extremely important, so that will be mm -hmm. uh, forthcoming. Um, and then finally, to ensure an enhanced presence around the globe, we're looking at reorganizing some of the fleet elements, which you're going to hear about uh, pretty soon. Um, pretty exciting stuff. It was part of my travels uh, to the Far East. Um, and then emphasis on partners and allies. It is a differentiator. I know you want to talk about that here in the opening round. All underlined by culture. Culture is the element that I've learned across every experience I've had working for you at one point, right? Mm -hmm. It was that culture, right? Mm -hmm. That essence of belonging to something that was greater than, than self. 
that you felt good about what you did, the organization you were part of each and every day, we've lost a little bit of that glow uh, on the Department of the Navy and we're bringing it back and we're bringing it back strong. In my travels, I feel it. I see it in the eyes of the sailors, the Marines. I was just down at Quantico yesterday. Um, it's exciting stuff. So all that is what I've been working on uh, since I arrived in this role in May. That is a long list of uh, things. Yeah, I'm going sorry on. I was a little bit. Uh, no, that's too great. Long I think you but, covered uh, a lot, and I, <clears throat> and I think what I'd like to do is maybe walk back a little bit to the beginning, and let's talk about your visit to the fleet. Um, you just recently went to. Uh, you were talking Westpac, so Guam, Japan, Singapore, and Palau. Um, you talked a little bit about what you heard and what you saw. Uh, first, let's talk about just the morale. Let's, the Secretary of the Navy, everybody works for you. How are they doing? No, they, they all work with me, right? There you go. So as a shipmate, I believe very strongly that, you know, it's one team, one fight. Uh, the commanding officer doesn't stand on the uh, bridge of the frigate and say full speed ahead without the engine men down there turning, uh, you know, the right controls to get the ship underway. So. One team, uh, I work with all the sailors and Marines around the globe. My job's a little different than the job they do. Actually, I think sometimes uh, the job they do is probably a little more rewarding, and you actually get to see the results mm -hmm. of the things that you do, <coughs> um, and you and I both know that. Um, and just so you know, I know that back when I was Vice Chinfo, sometimes you'd question me on, on travel and uh, my propensity to <laughs> like to travel. I would give you that, but let me yeah. tell you, that trip was done in under seven days. Yeah. I slept in between each one of the uh, places we visited in the aircraft. Thank God I had a little uh, couch there that uh, I could throw a sleeping bag on and literally that's what it was. No complaint because this is an ex unbelievable privilege to get to serve as the Secretary of the Navy and get to help direct the future of a force that you and I believe in so much. So um, Japan was a wonderful experience as it always is. The Japanese are some of our strongest, most committed allies. Um, I had a chance there to engage probably foremost with the sailors because our footprint there is so large. And wherever I went, uh, I was aboard the USS Milius. Um, the sailors there were extremely energized. They see and feel where the Navy is going. Uh, they sense the importance of what they're doing. Um, and uh, as Admiral Mullen uh, told both of us when we were young flag officers, the <coughs> principal role of a flag officer should be to go out and inspire uh, the sailors, uh, you know, uh, in their service uh, for uh, what it is that they do each and every day. So I endeavored to do that, uh, to follow that guidance, that rudder steer, um, and the feedback I get is phenomenal. I get asked lots of questions, uh, but at the end of the day, the morale is, is much better than what I think I thought it was going to be coming into the role. Um, so I, I don't think, <coughs> I, I think the value of you traveling absolutely is tremendous, right? I mean, the fleet needs to see Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, I just wanted to correct that record, right? Um, and tell you, though, that, that um, I think you having that perspective and bringing it back to inside the Beltway is invaluable, anybody in your role, right? And so, uh, and just the field. I concur with you on that. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't mean to and say. To, I, I yeah. will tell you this. My first tour I as a naval officer was at the Office of Legislative Affairs working up on Capitol Hill, but working out of the Pentagon where the Chief of Legislative Affairs resides, right? And I stayed away from the Pentagon my entire Navy career. When you came from uh, the uh, Ike up here, I didn't come up here from America. I went to Philadelphia. My last tour was the only second time I was ever stationed at the Pentagon. So I'm not a big fan of being yeah. inside that building because I don't yeah. think it gives you the perspective right. on fleet activities that getting out into you know, where our, our fleet is operating from. And to be able to see the threat. So you mentioned China earlier. That's even more important. And, uh, and so you saw up close. Uh, you had the opportunity to engage with our leaders, uh, our allies. Um, what is your feeling coming from that trip about China? I'll tell you, Admiral, I think that's probably the greatest threat to our country that Americans writ large do not understand. We're starting to understand that inside the Beltway, but I literally believe with all my heart and soul, and I can't stress this anymore, what we are seeing emerging is a threat beyond any comparison ever in the history of our country. Literally, not since the War of 1812 has our form of democracy been under the kind of pressure that we're going to see. By 2049, China, uh, China laid out a plan in 1949 that in 100 years, they wanted to be the preeminent nation in the world, predicated on their history. I'm a big history buff, as you mm -hmm. know, right? Mm -hmm. So the Middle Kingdom era of all the Chinese dynasties, I mean, they ruled the world 
or were influential world over, right, for centuries. They only fell off that pinnacle, right, in the mid-1800s because of the opium wars and the infighting, um, and, and they lost their supremacy. So for 100 years, from 1840 until following the end of World War II, when Mao Zedong brought China back as one unifying nation, they have now put themselves on a course to be what they've always felt historically they are. They're driven in this. They're passionate about it. There isn't anything that the Chinese don't do each and every day at every level, every strata of their society focused on that mission to get them back on the top. We can't say that in America as we're, you know, all the domestic uh, quarreling and you know, the, the divisiveness in our nation right now. We need to understand that the threat is not from within. The threat is from without. And it could change the very way that you and I live our lives. It could affect our children and our children's children and their ability to live in a free society. And, you know, Secretary of State Pompeo, Secretary Esper today are in India talking about this very thing because we see it for what it is. I mean, it is an unbelievable threat to our way of life. So, so as you talk to our allies over there, what are our allies saying? They see it, they see it of course, clearly. They live it, right? Yeah. So when I was in northern Norway in the Arctic, the China, China likes to call themselves a near-Arctic nation. Well, how they do that, I don't know. They're thousands of miles of their border from the Arctic Circle. But they've decided they have an interest in the Arctic. Why? It's very obvious. The Arctic is opening up. As it opens, that, uh, as it, opens up it becomes navigable. They can move their product, which provides their economy the impetus. And that's the big threat, right? Adversaries in the past didn't have the economic wherewithal, economic, the, the financial capability to build what China's building today. I just was in a, in a classified briefing this morning. China has 25 shipyards, Admiral, to our one. Wow. Right? When you think about that, what gave us the ability to come back after we were attacked at Pearl Harbor in 1941 was our industrial capability of building quicker than our adversaries could. We can't do that today. So that is the kind of concern we should have as Americans. There could be a day in our lifetime, my dear friend, that we will not have the freedom to speak our language the way that we do, to live with mm -hmm. you know, free and open society, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom to congregate. All those things could be eliminated because what we missed during a period called hide and buy, that was mm -hmm. uh, Deng Xiaoping's belief that China during the 90s needed to keep a low profile and stay under the, the radar scope so that they could build into a formidable world power. We then got caught in a war in the Middle East that took our attention and we took our eyes off the ball, especially in the Navy. You and I both know we moved into littoral warfare looking for a role for the United States Navy and we forgot about our commitments in, uh, in, you know, mm -hmm. in deep water. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're behind and we've got to catch up and we've got to catch up fast. So let me, let me uh, drill one more question on China and Absolutely. then move on from China. Um, Palau. Yes. Why Palau? Why Palau? Yeah. So Palau is our greatest ally as far uh, to the west um, on uh, that, uh, uh, that latitude of any other nation. And so they have shown their commitment to us. There's th the Secretary of, and of Defense and I talk all the time. This shouldn't be a secret. but. So yeah. look at my travels compared to his travels. That'll also tell you where I'm probably about to go, right? Yeah. I'm not just yeah. putting that. But he was in he was in, he Palau, was in Palau, right? And he and you I were in Palau. absolutely, right? And he's in India now, mm -hmm. and I see a, a real opportunity to open the door, Navy to Navy, with uh, the Indian Navy. I had an opportunity to operate with them in the early 2000s. They're an incredibly capable maritime force. Um, and again, the differentiator between us and the Chinese. Look at how many allies and partners we have. Look at how many allies and partners they have. Mm -hmm. And it's the way you conduct yourself. It's the way that you appreciate different cultures and you work together. One of the things I love about America is on a dollar bill, it says e pluribus unum. And I mm -hmm. won't test you, Admiral. I test the sailors all the time, but e pluribus unum, what does it mean? It's Latin, right? Yep. From many, one, one right? Yep. That's what America is. We're the melting pot. So we appreciate the cultures of the world because we come from all corners of the world to create you know, the greatest republic that's ever been known to mankind. As such, that's an advantage. That's uh, you know, a differentiator. Uh, that's a force multiplier um, in AORs around the world. And Palau is a committed ally of ours. They, they're right there on the at the tip of the spear 
uh, on the edge of Chinese influence, and they've committed themselves to us. Also, they have uh, you know port facilities that could be uh, you know very important to us as we move uh, our fleet assets around. And going back to Admiral Greenard and Admiral Richardson and their vision around distributed maritime operations, that's a big piece of where Admiral Gilday, our current CNO and IR, that is the key to, to the future uh, success of the Department of the Navy, is doubling down on DMO. So let me take you around the world. Yes. Uh, other side. Yep. Uh, you spent some time in Europe. Yeah, I spent a lot the, of time the up there. European fleet Former commander. Former ASW pilot. Yep. There you go. Um, and most recently, spent some time with the Brits. And, uh, I did. And, and they're uh, flying the Marine F-35 off their carrier. Um, we've got Russia, who's being a little aggressive with us out there. Um, we've got, Very aggressive. We've got Turkey and the Med. Um, give us a lay down on what's going on in Europe. Yeah, great question, and you teed up something which is really near and dear to my heart. Again, student of history. In the early days of World War II, we struggled. Uh, so I went to Quantico to, to talk about Wake Island, to talk about Guadalcanal, because literally what we saw then was our inability to be interoperable. We created a fleet at the beginning of World War II that, that, was, uh, that involved the British, the Dutch, the Australians, and the U.S. That fleet was decimated by one nation, uh, the Empire of Japan, because we couldn't operate together. We'd never exercised together, we never communicated, and most importantly, we never had the integration. I am a huge advocate and proponent of integrated operations, of being able to put our Marine F-35 Bravos aboard HMS Queen Elizabeth and operate, as we will here in the coming year, full deployment, six, seven month deployment, halfway around the world, one of our squadrons will be under the command and control of the Royal Navy. That's interoperability at the highest level. I've offered the same when I was in Italy to the Minister of Defense of Italy to be able to operate our 35 Bravos off uh, the Italian carrier Cavour. I did the same thing when I was in Japan when I met with the new Minister of Defense um, and offered the same thing. Integration is key. We have to be there if we're going to be fully capable as a as a allied force at sea. That's a great segue. So partners important, right? I mean that's that's the key. And force you talk multiplier. About history and and what 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 can happen now in the future. Right. That force multiplier. So let's talk about a little bit about the future of our force. Yep. You mentioned Battle Force 2045. Right. And, uh, future Naval Force. Study. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Secretary uh, Esper is, has talked a little bit about it. 500 ships, as you mentioned, uh, autonomous unmanned and manned vehicles, manned ships. Uh, more submarines, as you mentioned, uh, 11 carriers, uh, 8 to 11 carriers, 6 light carriers. What more can you tell us about what's in Battle Force 2045? And so I will tell you, I've known Secretary Esper for a long time. Not as long as I've known you, but a pretty long time. And I can tell you that he is a naval advocate, right? I mean, he uh, has uh, gotten beat up a little bit uh, before I got into the seat, but he was hoping that I would be the Secretary of the Navy earlier after I was uh, nominated. Uh, because he wanted to be very forthcoming uh, with the uh, future naval force study um, and now Battle Force uh, 2045 because he understands the importance of uh, the Navy Marine Corps team coupled with the Commandant's vision, the CNO's uh, distributed maritime operations and what that means and we have to put more platforms at sea. Today the largest Navy in the world? China. That's correct, right? PLAN, right? They got about 354 ships at sea, or 50, 354 ships that could deploy today. We have about uh, 301, right? Now, there is a differentiator. Ours are more capable, ours are more sophisticated, we have greater technology, uh, but that could wane, right? You need to be prepared. And as I learned uh, in my life, Quality is important, but sometimes quantity has a quality all of its own, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm mm -hmm. reminded about uh, the Zulu, uh, you know, warriors and you know, massing millions of uh, of spear carrying uh, warriors that overcame British, you know, mechanized forces. So anyway, all that said is, we need to build a larger, more capable navy. So emphasis first and foremost on uh, on our submarines, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to build beyond. I said during my confirmation hearing that I was an advocate to build up to 66 submarines. Um, this study showed us we need more than that, so we're going to build 70 to 80. Um, and we're also going to look at the next generation of uh, SSN. 
Also, as I mentioned, we're going to replace our Ohio class, which are long overdue. Another peace dividend we cashed in the 90s and early thousands because we didn't think there was going to be that threat. There will always be that threat. Democracy yeah. is something that you know, threatens those that don't believe in it, right? So our SS SSBN fleet will come online here, uh, 12 uh, submarines. Um, then, as I mentioned, our carriers. I know there's a big question around 8 to 11. Um, I was pushing for a little higher number on the lower side uh, because I knew everybody was going to go after that, right? Yeah. As a former naval aviator, you know, oh my God, the Navy's turning away from carriers. We're not turning away from carriers. You know, the carrier strike group is, you know, core to the way that we power project. And sea control has become even more important in ensuring freedom of navigation, especially in the Western Pacific. So our carriers are not going to go away. We've got to figure out the right number, the right number that we can afford, the right number we require. World War II, we won the Battle of Atlantic on the backs of CVLs, light carriers, mm -hmm. that were able to give us ASW advantage over the U-boat threat, right? When you look and you think about the threat that emanates from the Atlantic today, it's a little different. We touched on it earlier. The submarine capability of Russia has gotten uh, more challenging, more concerning, right? So maybe there's a way that we can shift and perhaps take some of those strike groups and put them where the threat is, is greater and supplant that with another asset that uh, we believe will bear uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of promise in the future because how do we know what the carrier air wing is going to look like, right. right? Are they all going to look like Joint Strike Fighters or FNA 18s, right? Or are they going to be smaller, unmanned? And therefore, do I have the same punch on a CVL, right, that I have on a CVN today because I'm able to have 100 unmanned aircraft flying off of a 750, 800 uh, foot long uh, ship. Yeah. So that's the excitement. It took us 30, I don't know the exact, I think 25, 30 years, I remember, I think I was in 05 when we started talking about the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. And it's taken us that long to bring it online. So what's 20, 25 years from now? What is technology going to look like between now and then as to what, you know, uh, aviation platform is going to be that next generation, that sixth generation uh, fighter? Yeah. And speaking of technology um, and carriers, here we got the Ford coming online. Great ship, by the way. Yeah, massive improvement in technology, a right? PR, so have you been to it? A PR implosion that, that you probably could have fixed, Admiral, when you were our chinfo, honestly, because we did the right thing logically. We, that ship was starting to uh, be delayed in being able to bring it to sea. So what we did is we took it to sea without it fully completed. The elevators had not been certified yet, but we knew that if we put that ship at sea, we could use it, right, as our carrier qualification platform. And we could recover and launch, you know, our aircraft out of Oceana on the East Coast, freeing up one of our other carriers to forward deploy that didn't have to have that. That was the brilliance of where the Department of the Navy was before I got here, which I think, as a businessman, that's logical. That's good mm -hmm. return on investment. The problem was all of the PR that emanated from that because the elevators weren't working, the new catapults, uh, you know, weren't functioning mm -hmm. properly, the emails, mm -hmm. you know, it got a bad rap. It is an incredible warship. And it is the future of our Navy. And as you look to power projection, as you look to parity, because the Chinese are building aircraft carriers, um, you know, at an alarming rate, by the way, just so uh, you know that. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to their 25 shipyards to R1, um, that ship will be uh, a keystone of our fullest projection of the future. So let's go to a question we have uh, from the audience here. Denby Starling asks, uh, how do we afford this future? Future yeah, that's fleet. That's, I mean, a, that's yeah. a great question. So how much is freedom worth to you, Admiral? Yeah. Right? How do we not afford it? We're going to have to make some tough choices, right? We have domestic pressures. I'm the healthcare executive, right? And I come out of an industry that's extremely important to every single one of us because healthcare touches us or touches our loved ones or touches our friends. We all need good health care, right? But we could have the greatest health care system in the world. But if we don't have freedom, if democracy is rent asunder because of the challenges we see around the globe, which again, I'm going to beat this drum loudly. It's more pressing than it's ever been in the history of our nation. That's, so how, that's how challenging yeah. it is to where we are today. It's hard, right? So Secretary Esper credits you with, cutting, with finding $40 billion. $46 billion, Adam. $46. Well, I think he credited you billion. with 40 but good. Well, he good could have given me, because he challenged me, as a good businessman would. He said, if you can accrue more savings. There had been an effort underway inside the Department of the Navy to find some savings. But, you know, instead of flipping over every rock, right? You go after the ones that are going to bear the most fruit. If you don't have the time, right, to cultivate all the trees in the orchard, you go after the ones that are the most mature, that are producing the most fruit. We did that. 
we went after those line items that had the greatest opportunity for 10, 15. You can always take 15% out of pretty much anything you're operating, Frank. I mean that with all mm -hmm. my heart. I saw that in healthcare. You know, I ran a performance improvement company. We did that in almost every hospital. You can get that kind of savings. I told General Mattis that when I was on the transition team that in military healthcare, we can find 10 or 15%. Well, we can find 10 or 15% across the entire Navy. And the sec def challenged me on that. Ken, you deliver savings. You show me and I'll match you two for one or one for one. I mean, literally, he put his money on the table to match mine. Man, I jumped on that uh, like a bee on a pile of honey. That was so a that, good deal. And that gets you to building more ships. Yes, sir. And Absolutely. So plan That's right one now, way, yep. right? The plan right now is 20 frigates. Uh, oh, we'll build more than that. National Security Advisor the other day <laughs> said two a year is not yeah. enough. Maybe three, maybe four a year. So it's great to have that kind of support in the White House, and uh, I'd love to see us build. I'm a huge fan of that ship. It is an incredibly capable vessel. I've been up, uh, I went up to uh, the shipyard at Marinette uh, earlier in the summer, uh, literally within weeks after uh, taking uh, this office, because I wanted to see the ship before I named it. I spent a lot of time picking the name for that ship to mm -hmm. make it, again, fit into the culture piece mm -hmm. of who we are and what we are as the United States Navy. That ship is incredible, and that will be a differentiator. And so, yes, 20 is what we're, uh, we're uh, projecting now, but we'll build more than 20 of those. The other thing that's great, I have a concept in my head, is we create a joint strike fighter that we could share with NATO allies. Why can't we create a joint strike frigate? Why can't we take that same platform and offer it you know, to our allies and partners around the world? After all, it is a, an amalgamation of an Italian-U.S. Uh, joint effort to build that ship in a U.S. shipyard. Right? So it's already got international uh, you know, uh, footprint. Um, and so why couldn't uh, our friends in the Royal Navy think if they're building a new frigate that that might be the hull, or our friends in Norway, or our friends uh, you know, around the globe? And it's, it's coming together as a great American frigate. I mean, great name. It I is, mean, it's, it's it is perfect a great the way American that's going frigate. forward. So, th so talk technology. Well, you taught me PR, sharing. Admiral. And I don't uh, know you about know. that. I don't <laughs> know about that. Hypersonic <laughs> missiles. Yes. Uh, again. National Security Advisor says every destroyer is going to carry hypersonic missiles. When well, does that happen? Well, that's going to be a while as we work through the technology, but absolutely, it has to, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be able to match the threat, and so mm -hmm. that's something we need to get to. That's going to take, uh, you know, uh, planning, retrofitting. Uh, we will get there, though, because we have to. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no, uh, no exception to yep. that. So when uh, National Security Advisor O'Brien said that, he was spot on. Yeah. may so take us a little longer than we'd like, but we will get there. Yeah, but speed has a quality of its own too, Amen. right? Amen. Which goes to shipyard capacity. Um, and you, you uh, were recently on a ship in maintenance and uh, had some great remarks about the importance of the maintenance period for a ship in the life of a ship. There's some concern about the capacity we have here in the United States. To your point, China building all these ships, our capacity to build ships as well as repair ships Amen. in the private shipyards as well as the public shipyards. Where are we on shipyards? Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to give a plug to my dear assistant secretary of the Navy, Hondo Gertz. I know Hondo uh, uh, was on uh, your show. Uh, he is an incredible professional, has done an incredible job. Um, literally, uh, you know, his uh, vision, his foresight, his ability to get down into the weeds, into the details, um, has been an incredible blessing to me. Um, and as we work through this, you know, we have to ensure that we've got the infrastructure to support what the vision is, right? We've got to keep all the shipyards we have today operating uh, and fully capable. You know, I was, as you know, uh, stationed up at the Navy Yard in Philadelphia, and I watched this immense uh, industrial, uh, you know, infrastructure, uh, you know, go away because, again, we thought we could cash in a great peace, peace dividend. Mm -hmm. Two of the largest dry docks on the East Coast are in that shipyard, right? The shipyard's limping along today, but there could be an opportunity there. There could be an opportunity in all of those shipyards if we're going to have parity with the Chinese. And you and I both know that in building a Navy, it's always cooler to build new rather than to fix old, right? It's the mm -hmm. same thing with fixing your car with rather than going out and buying a new car. Everybody likes yeah. to buy a new car. But we have to fix what we have because there's an affordability issue, right? But we also need to invest, right, in that infrastructure to make sure those shipyards are capable. You know, I was talking to Assistant Secretary Chuck Williams, uh, uh, retired admiral. Uh, he is our installations and environments Assistant Secretary, uh, another super great professional real estate uh, executive about the importance of our installations. And they always end up getting the short end of the stick because we are focused on building ships, right? And of course, we have to take care of the most important asset we have, our sailors and our Marines, right? So where does installations end up? They end up at the bottom of the uh, list of priorities. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got to change that. We've yeah. got to tie our installations 
to the Battle Force 2045 and the importance of what those installations mean to the capabilities of our ships and their ability to be ready and fully forward deployed. So I'm, I'm glad you addressed that, and, and I'm glad you also talked about the people. We're going to come back. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come quick back break and talk already? about people <laughs> and culture. All right. Aye. We'll be right back. Here's the thing about managing multiple clouds for your business. Oh. Oh. <laughs> when you've got public clouds and private clouds and hybrid clouds, things can get a bit cloudy for you. But now, there's the Dell Technologies Cloud. Powered by VMware, a single hub for a consistent operating experience across all your clouds. That should clear things up. Think Cantieri's partnership with the Navy to deliver the world's greatest warship, the future USS Constellation, remains on schedule and on budget. A unique system of yards approach, along with the 2,000 men and women who work here, represent a talented and competent capability for our nation. America's premier shipbuilding team is committed to bringing competition and innovation into every endeavor because our Navy and our nation deserve the absolute best value. Welcome back. Uh, so so uh, we've got questions coming in. Uh, not a whole lot of them. Keep them coming and uh, like them and they'll float to the top. We're also going to get to a fleet question in this section. Um, but the Secretary's got a lot to say and we're, this is a great <laughs> conversation, so we appreciate it. Um, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to talk to you about Navy culture. Uh, you have really uh, staked out from the very beginning. Matter of fact, as long as I've known you, right? Your focus on culture, having the right culture, doing the right thing, et cetera. I'd like to quote from your testimony uh, you said, quote, it saddens me to say the Department of the Navy is in troubled waters due to many factors, primarily the failings of leadership. You went on to say the trouble with the incidents you had experienced over the last 30 or so years, quote, are all indicative of a breakdown in the trust of those leading the service. What did you mean by that? <laughs> and what are you seeing in the five months you've been secretary so far? So one of your classmates, Plebe Summer, told me, I remember this clearly, told our whole squad, said, welcome to the United States Naval Academy. You now represent the greatest uh, naval institution, greatest naval school in the world, and you live in a fishbowl. And everything you do reflects on the honor, on the prestige, uh, on the future capabilities of this institution. And I, my whole Navy career, have believed that our actions right, reflect not just on ourselves, but on the organization that we're part of. Mm -hmm. And I believe that leaders have to hold themselves to an incredibly high standard. You can't enjoy perhaps, you know, the, the fruits of the world as you could if you weren't in a role that you were responsible for setting the example for others, right? You have an unbelievable responsibility to keep the bar set very high. And those naval officers that inspired me in my service, going back to Commander, later Admiral Joseph Strasser, right, mm -hmm. always, always set the example for people like me. I, Admiral Tom Lynch comes to mind. Secretary John Lehman, right? They lived to a standard that ensured that the organization itself could live up to itself. The Navy is greater than any one part of it. We, as leaders in the Navy, have an obligation to that organization to be the ones who set the example for all others. And unfortunately, our former shipmates let our organization down. I watched that. You and I watched that during our career, right? And so I want to emphasize, I can't change everybody's life and the way they conduct themselves, but I can emphasize the importance of it and how they hold themselves to a standard that should be unquestionable um, when it comes to ethics, comes to morals and principles, the ethos honor, courage, mm -hmm. commitment, the things that make us who we are. That's what I want to emphasize. And if it starts with me carrying a little flag and being the you know, principal chair, then, that, then that's where it's going to start. Because I do believe it starts in the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations Office. The two of us working together right, to set the standard for all others so that they can aspire and they can have, they, they, they can be part of something that they're proud of. Mm -hmm. that there's pride in service. You know, the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps flags behind you, they've emphasized this since their inception. And when you think about, right, the traditions of the Marine Corps, 
and their belief to what it represents. You'll see that. The Commandant and I talked about that, right? Sometimes in the Navy, we don't hold ourselves in the same light. We don't recognize all that has been done to create the service we have today, all the sacrifices, all those yeah. who have gone before us that have set this standard so high. We have an obligation to them. And more importantly, to carry on that legacy, we've got an obligation to those who come in the future because Admiral Frank Thorpe, you and I would not have joined the United States Navy if we didn't believe it was something we wanted to be part of. It was the best team that we could join. That made it something that was special. And that's my passion, is to ensure that our Navy is believed by the kids who serve in it today and those who come tomorrow that it's as great as it ever was and will be even more so into the future. So what are you seeing today? You've had an opportunity to work with CNN on the Commandant, the, uh, the leadership. Matter of fact, I would say you've had an opportunity to observe petty officers through admirals. What are you seeing today? In, in the, in, in, uh, what, is your, what are your thoughts on current leadership today? Well, I'm a proverbial forward? optimist, right? So I was born that way. I always will be. The glass could be empty, and I would see it as uh, at least half full. Um, you know, I believe that everything is there. First of all, we have an incredible uh, chief of naval operations and an incredible commandant. Dave Berger and Mike Gilday are exactly what the Navy and the Marine Corps need today. The Commandant's vision, his perspective on the future of the Marine Corps could have only come from him to put the Marine Corps back into the Navy and make it an amphibious uh, war, uh, war fighting uh, uh, force that goes back to its roots. And that's what the coming conflict could be all about. Re looking to the past to get the vectors for the future because the fleet Marine Force concept that was born out of the 1930s gave us the edge after Guadalcanal and through the rest yeah. of the island chain in the Pacific. The United States doesn't need two armies, a Marine Corps and the United States Army, right? Land-centric. They need one army and one Marine Corps, an amphibious force, married up with the Navy. That's General Dave Berger's vision. And he's taken some heat for that. Meanwhile, Admiral Michael Gilday, right? A little more uh, low-key in his approach, but has been focused, laser-focused, on the technologies that will take our Navy into the future He's a cyber warrior. He understands that space better than anybody that I've ever served with, uh, having commanded the 10th Fleet. He recognizes the importance of unmanned technology. There's an article today in the clips talking about that as he's tasked the department to really look into how we can get there faster, sooner, with uh, more capabilities. And he's a realist for what it is today. Uh, but as Admiral Stavarita has told both of us, you know, we're the yin and the yang that we come together at this point to be able to you know, project the Navy into the future. Yeah, and then I don't want to cut you short. We're going to run out of time yep. here a little bit. I want to talk. I want to take a question from the fleet. I promised I would do that. Uh, we got a question from the fleet uh, about equal opportunity. If, if uh, we could go to that question from the fleet. Hello, DC-1 Stephen Reedus from the USS Ronald Reagan, and my question for the SegNav is. Sir, as one of the command climate specialists on board Reagan, I see a lot of junior sailors getting into trouble for issues that have to do with sexual harassment. Is there some kind of way to get a program that delivers more intensive training at boot camp when it comes to the issues of equal opportunity and sexual harassment? I'd like to take that question and uh, equal opportunity, respect. You became the Secretary of the Navy three days after George Floyd died. CNO had a pretty strong reaction and a pretty strong message of the fleet, as did the Commandant. What are you seeing out there, and what do you see in the future in order to take the leaps that the CNO and the Commandant have called on for the Navy and the Marine Corps in this area of equal opportunity and treating others with respect? So it starts with education, Admiral. It always starts with education. And so uh, um, DC-1 was absolutely right. We need to start that uh, in recruit training. Uh, Vice Admiral John Nowell, our Chief of Navy Personnel, is a classmate of mine, um, and we talked about this, the emphasis um, on equal opportunity. I talked a little bit earlier about e pluribus unum from many one. Mm -hmm. I mean, sexual harassment um, and, uh, and, and, and any other affront to creating one team, the appreciation for who we are, each and every one of us, you know, racial injustice in this country or sexual harassment, all the rest of it, can be eliminated through education, through the awareness that we're all human beings put on this earth to do good for mankind. And the Navy and the Marine Corps are stronger for that diversity. It's also a differentiator, a force multiplier. When you come at something with diverse 
with diverse perspective. It enriches the fabric of the organization. It makes it more capable. I've seen this in the public sector. I've seen it in the private sector. The good news is, as I move around the fleet, they embrace that. Young sailors today are more diverse, but they're all also much more inclusive. The difference is there's a lot more communicating going on in the Navy today than there was when you and I were young sailors mm -hmm. because of social media, because of the, uh, the opportunity to interact um, across platforms. And so we see things differently. We notice things a lot more than we did in the past. But it is a better Navy today, and it's going to be better in the future are as we long as we are keep we where it. we need to be? No, absolutely not. And we need to continue to push it to the surface. I had a bracelet on, uh, you know, suicide. I get asked about this all the time. You know, why is there this, you know, huge epidemic in the military, uh, in the Navy, in the Marine Corps, to suicide, right? It's because social media is a means by which people can find places where suicide is okay, right? It's an option. When you and I were young, we didn't have that, mm -mm. Ra right? So we would never think about that. Today, you know, it's an option, right? So I carried that on my wrist. I just gave it to an HM3 out in Japan uh, who was focused on suicide prevention. Um, as a reminder, right, well, this is another area that we need to focus on um, is to ensure that, um, you know, uh, racial injustice and sexual harassment um, go away very quickly. There's nothing that disturbs me more, especially in a lot of our accession programs when I, you know, see incidents of this. And I have a zero tolerance. Um, for it. If I see it, and a person who's given a role of leadership, again, going back to your question about setting the example for others, by elevating the standard by which we live, zero tolerance for any leader who, um, who allows that to be part of their command fabric. So I promised you that we would uh, wrap this up in time for you to get to another meeting here at 2 o'clock. Um, let me ask you one final question. Um, you've talked about history and your appreciation for history, and I've always known you to be uh, somebody who could rattle off great facts and <laughs> and, uh, and bore you. And, and, and uh, <laughs> no, I think we should call you Mahan or something like that. But um, so you go back 40 years, more than 40 years now since when you were a police. Now don't you know dime me out for my age. Uh, there you yeah. go. Well, you, st you started really young. Uh, well, I am younger than you are. You are. <laughs> Not much. But let's look forward. Yes, sir. Um, and you've talked a lot about using the past. CBLs as an example. Um, uh, World War II, War of 1812. Where do you see the Navy, you're the secretary, you get to set the course. Where do you see the Navy in five years, 10 years? Arguably, you're setting the course for 20 years from now. When you are talking to your team and building the force for the future, the Navy, the Marine Corps for the future, what do you see in those five, 10, 20 years? 25 years, Battle Force 2045. Um, I see the Navy playing catch up if we take the threat seriously if we recognize it for what it is, and I think I've, uh, I've pretty much uh, you know, beaten that message uh, uh, to the degree that I can. Um, we need to be on that path. We need, to we need to recognize what the threat is. We need to train to it. We need to ensure that readiness uh, is, uh, is a key component of all that. We need to invest in that to ensure that we never go back uh, to 2017, probably one of the darkest chapters, uh, at least in modern uh, uh, naval history. Mm -hmm. um, history provides us a lot of vectors, right? It doesn't tell us what the future is going to be, but there are lessons to be learned from what we see in the past to what could be in the future. H humankind is all about, you know, repeating the mistakes of the past. And it's our job to look back, to be able to project forward, to understand what could be, to prepare so it never happens. One of my other favorite, um, you know, historical figures is General George Marshall, right? So the Army Chief of Staff during World War II later became Secretary of State and Secretary, one of our first Secretary of Defense. He received the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, Norway in 1952. And when he was asked, General, how do we ensure that we win World War III? His response was, the only way we ensure we win World War III is to prevent it. And how do we prevent it? We prevent it through deterrence. And how do we provide deterrence? It starts with the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps being that capable force for the future to ensure that we are on the front lines of democracy, vigilant to ensure that our country continues in the future the way it's lived in the past, free. 
Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. Thank you for that situation report. And, and I have to tell you, sitting here, uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. Uh, you're in the arena. You didn't need to come back into this uh, five-sided uh, building. And, uh, and my family lives in Pennsylvania. I'm a geo bachelor. In fact, my classmates tell me I must be crazy giving up this, you know, lovely ambassador's residence. Uh, you know, we had housekeepers, and there's a chef that came with it. And as a middle-class kid who grew up in a little Cape Cod house in Michigan, you know, taking my wife there uh, was kind of a fairy tale. And ripping her out of there, putting her back in our home in Pennsylvania, and then I lived down here as a geo bachelor. There's been some tough times for our family, but you know what? We wouldn't do it any other way. This is an incredible privilege. As I tell the sailors and Marines, to have the opportunity to be back in the family, mm -hmm. to be with them again, this is the greatest gift that I've ever been given, other than my wife and children. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. And again, thank you for doing what you're doing. And thank you all for joining us today for our fourth sit rep. I uh, appreciate you, uh, you joining us. Sorry we didn't get to as many questions uh, from the audience. And uh, we had a couple more questions lined up for the fleet. The secretary has a lot to say, which is uh, really good. We can, we can tell you're engaged. And uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, stay tuned for our uh, next event. Uh, will be our Veterans Day reclaim ceremony. We'll do it live right here from, uh, from the Navy Memorial. And I'd also, again, like to thank our, our sponsors. Our series co-sponsor this year, uh, Navy Mutual Aid Insurance, and our event sponsors, uh, Huntington Ingalls, Dell, and Finn Cantieri, and our event co-sponsors, BAE Systems, uh, Murata, and LMI. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and fair winds and following seas. The Lone Sailor a powerful symbol of the sacrifice of sea service personnel, past, present, and future. For more than two decades, the Navy Memorial has placed 16 of these iconic figures around the country and the world. Now you can contribute to this story tradition and help place our next statue at one of the most significant battlefields of the 20th century, the D-Day beaches of Normandy. Be a part of history and help ensure their sacrifice is never forgotten. Make your tax-deductible donation today.